I'm Catherine Veneman. This is at Blaffer. We're at Blaffer Art Museum, and we are doing the third round of artist talks for the 45th annual School of Art Master of Fine Arts thesis exhibitions. We are very pleased uh, that uh, the final round of artists will be joining us, starting with Adrian Munoz, who is right here. And, uh, and we will uh, go ahead and just introduce him and get started. Uh, Adrian is a Houston-based artist. And <clears throat> during his time as an undergraduate student at the University of North Texas, uh, Munoz uh, initially focused his studies on drawing and painting, receiving a degree in, in, studio, in studio arts. Shifting focus of, onto graphic design, he is now completing his degree in graphic design um, at the School of Art, getting his MFA. So welcome. Thank you. Um, so just to kind of briefly introduce the work that I've done, it's really sort of about this uh, kind of conglomeration of uh, false narratives. And this false narratives really began with a story that I was told when I was a child. And the story went this way, which is that my great-grandfather was a successful tailor in Chile and that he became uh, very wealthy and was very prominent in his community. Um, but unfortunately, over time, he became an alcoholic and succumbed to his alcoholism. And of course, with that sort of um, thing happening to someone, there became a lot of uh, broken relationships within the family and that sort of continuing on um, through the generations. Um, and so that was a story that even though it ended tragically, it was a story that I was told that I kind of internalized, you know? I saw it as sort of like a, a positive thing that even though it was negative in the end, I really took a lot of comfort that my grandfather was um, you know, sort of despite the odds, was successful. And so I started off by asking my father first about this story and whether or not this story was true. And he would say, yes, that's, of course, it's the true story. It's the story we've all been told. And so then we took the story to my great-grandfather and we started asking him, so is this true? And he, he eventually said, oh, sorry, my, my grandfather. And we eventually, he eventually just admitted, like, well, no, not entirely. He was... Really, he just worked at a textile mill and he wasn't really uh, a tailor. And so then from there, I began wanting to have interviews with sort of my uncles and my grandmother and trying to understand this, this culture that they came from. Because when I was a child, I used to come into their, their, my grandparents' home and being born in Houston, I didn't understand this world that they came from. I didn't know... You know, I, I didn't know what Chile was. I didn't know, they all spoke Spanish and I'd never, I didn't even know how to speak Spanish. No one ever sat me down and said, hey, this is sort of our culture and this is where we come from. Um, so I took these interviews that I was having as an opportunity to not only get close to my family members, but to understand the culture and the lineage that I come from. So as I started investigating my family, I started to find out sort of the political situation that happened in Chile when they were living there. And so while they were living there, there was a, of course, a very well-known coup d'etat that occurred in uh, 1973. So my family was living there at the time, and as they're telling me the experiences that they had, they're showing me sort of the, some of these photographs that I found of them living there and it's just them living their lives while this you know, horrible event is going on. And so they're, they're showing me identification documents of them coming over to Houston. They're showing me uh, their passports. And you know, this story starts to come to life to me. Um, and the more I start looking into the, the coup d'etat that occurred in Chile, I start to find out, OK, this, this isn't as black and white as I thought it was. There's discrepancy of how much the United States is connected to the coup d'etat that occurred in Chile. There's discrepancy of what was the death of the president who was in Chile and the connections that he had with Fidel Castro. 
Um, and so I started to see these sort of parallel stories of even this event in history was not so clear as to what happened. And it was, I was sort of connecting the dots to my own family history, that the story that I had been told wasn't so connected either. So I chose this to, to tell these stories through these, um, these TVs. My grandfather used to work at an electronics store, and so I used to see him have all these TVs that he would work on in his garage. And so technology was a big part of his, you know, who he was. And so these stories sort of show the beginning of um, Chile, the political things going on in there, and then the coup d'etat, and then when my family first got to Houston, when they first got to Houston, they began filming videos of themselves, um, and they would send these videotapes to their family that was still in Chile. And so it's kind of funny to think about because nowadays we have like FaceTime and all these things and it's like we don't have a record of all these events. But when I started, you know, looking into my family, I started finding all of these videos that show, oh, um, it's, you know, like in that video, specifically my grandmother saying, well, I've gotten fatter and my hair has gotten longer and she's sort of updating them on what they're doing. And my, my uncles are saying, and my father are saying, well, we're playing sports and you know, this is what we're doing. And so they're updating the family in Chile as to like what they're, what's going on. So there was this dialogue back and forth between my family here in the United States and my family in Chile. Um, but as I started to discover all these stories about my family and, and sort of how they're layered with history, I started to ask myself, well, how do I fit in this story too? So I started first by um, writing a bunch of stories from my childhood, what it was like living in a Chilean home. And so a lot of these stories kind of describe like my perspective as a child and what I experienced. And so I eventually edited it down and uh, put it into four short stories, which the book uh, collects. And in each short story, is connected to an illustration or a drawing that I did. So the first story describing uh, an uncomfortable dinner that happened when I was a child and you know they're all yelling in Spanish and I don't know what they're saying and I'm a kid and so I'm trying to like read their faces and I'm trying to understand what's happening um, but I don't know what's going on and as this is happening I'm sort of scraping my knees against this concrete horse figurine that's holding up the dining table and so this was sort of a, like a story that was embedded into my memory as a child. And each drawing is connected to a story or experience that I had when I was a child, each drawing. Um, and then collectively, it's sort of, you know, all of the, the history, the research, this archive that I've collected, having these conversations, um, with my family and sort of discovering my roots. Um, but in each sort of panel that I've created, there's a, a statement that's written with it. And the statement is meant to be ambiguous. It can be true, it can be false. It's not something that is, uh, you know, on surface value may be straightforward, but if you were to read the book, you would find out, oh, it's actually not true. And so this is sort of connected to what I was told as a child. These, these stories of my family that I was told as a child. Um, and uh, an additional layer to the, the TVs that I made is that there's an augmented reality uh, aspect to it. So if you download the Artivive app, you can actually watch each video and, uh, and you'll learn a little bit about like the, the things that I saw in the history and my family. And then eventually it ending with um, my family, or me and my brother playing in my grandparents' home. Um, so looking at it from afar, it sort of broadly tells this chaotic story of my family's life and the, the life that I experienced. How did you connect um, some of the kind of recurring structures in here? Like each, each image seems to have a screen uh, with the video playing on it, and each seems to have similar kind of 
um, images. Can you tell us like kind of what connections the viewer can draw from the narrative behind the images? Maybe just like walk us through one of these um, images, these well, I think um, I knew pretty early on that I, I collected a lot. Like I, I have so much. I mean, even just what I have right now is just like a, a fragment of, of all the stuff that I've, all the photos and videos and everything that I have. So it was actually really difficult trying to figure out what should be on the wall, what shouldn't be on the wall. And so I realized early on, okay, I need to have like a sort of structure, you know, like a sort of rhythm to how this is going to play out. Um, so that's eventually I end up looking at you know, focusing on certain things and then kind of creating these these sort of layers um, But looking at this one This one is sort of specifically like if I'm to, supposed to break down the elements like it's specifically talking about like my ancestry and like this was the photograph the earliest photograph of my family that I found and then in the background is the Andes mountains and then Further in the background is a, uh, a booklet that my grandfather gave me that containing our whole family history. And then these, the drawing and then the, the TV panel are sort of showing the, the political atmosphere that was beginning to happen. Um, and so this shows an interview of Allende where they're talking to him and they're trying to, you know, they're asking him about his politics and sort of the, uh, uh, I guess you can say the the criticisms that he was receiving at the time. Um, and then these are the glasses that they found <clears throat> in La Moneda, which is like the like their White House um, of Allende. And they, they found them and they have them in, in a uh, museum in Chile. Yeah, it and yes, I have started um, doing that, and it's it's funny that you mention it because I'm realizing right now that I didn't do it um, like it's kind of happened organically. I didn't do it consciously because um, I've already started just like I like I have a tripod and I just set my camera and I film us just eating dinner, and there's no point to it. I just do it because I think it's like it's I don't know. It's kind of fun to do it. Um, yeah, and even like I've started kind of thinking about like my relationship to like social media and those sorts of things because they feel sort of shallow, especially when I start looking back and seeing like, oh, like there's a physical tape that I have and I have to actually learn how do I get the right technology that connects with it and also uh, finding all these like handwritten documents and people actually went out of their way to like write all these things and to keep them, you know, to treasure them. So with how personal this project is, I was wondering if you would mind sharing maybe what was the most difficult aspect of putting it together? Uh, that's tough, because there's a, I can go like a technical way, but also I can go like an emotional sort of route. Um, I feel like the emotional route's more interesting. So. Um, as I started looking into history and sort of just discovering these uh, things about what happened in the coup in Chile, and also just my own family history, um, I knew that I wanted to ask my grandfather about his relationship with his father, because his father was an alcoholic. And so I didn't really know how to bring that up, because it's sort of, it's uncomfortable, you know? And I really don't have that much of a close relationship with my grandfather anyways, so, I didn't really know how to talk about it, um, but I remember at dinner we were we were talking, and I would start first with asking him about Chile and how it was and everything, and then eventually I did ask him, you know, what do you remember about your father? And 
Um, he chose to tell me a story that he remembered when he was a kid, which was him going to the beach and, you know, he, he was, his dad was holding him on his shoulders. And so I thought, and that's all he told me. It's just this beautiful day on the beach. And I thought it was really interesting that that's what he chose to, to talk about over anything else. Yeah, I, I definitely struggle with that too. Because like I, I don't, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, like I don't speak Spanish. I don't understand the world that they come from. Um, I try to. Uh, I mean, even to the smallest things of like, I don't even like like the, the Chilean food that they give me. You know, it's like the smallest things is like, it's foreign to me. Um, but I still try to, to understand like the world that they come from. Um, and I actually think making this work, it made me, I guess, connect more to, to my roots and to who I am. Um, but yeah, it is sort of uncomfortable because it's like, I mean, at this point in time, I've sort of come to a place where I'm okay with the fact that I'm somewhere in the middle. You know, I don't exist in a you know, I, I don't feel like I'm too American, but I also don't feel like I'm too Chilean. You know, I'm, some, I'm something in the middle. I've become something else. And I've become okay with that, you know, and, and that's just sort of where I'm at right now. It, I think that, you know, that was maybe like our timer button <laughs> going off, but we do have, if anyone, does anyone have a final question? It's kind of a two-part question, but uh, um, number one is through the process of this making of this project, do you feel like, was there any added resolution amongst your family in terms of sort of a revelation of truth or was there any healing that came through this process? Um, and then the second part is given that it's so personal and that like it was very much sort of built upon this particular narrative in your future work, how, where will you draw upon to create your work, you know, outside of this particular storyline? Um, well, I think, I don't think that my work specifically has caused any sort of um, like healing or anything like that. But I do think that that has started to happen. I mean, I've noticed lately with my family that there has been a rekindling and sort of a connection, more connections happening. Um, I, I couldn't tell you why or, you know, what that is, um, but I have noticed that it is beginning to happen, um, which is a good thing for me because I get to ask more questions and get to learn more about them. Um, so I see that as a good thing and I, I hope that that continues to happen. Um, but thinking of that second part of your question, um, one thing I would say one of the most important things that I learned as sort of like an artist, as a designer, as just a creator in making this work is that um, it's good to, to trust in your gut. Because there were a lot of moments where I thought, like when I was gonna pitch this idea to my faculty, I thought they're just, they're never gonna want this, you know, or nobody's ever gonna be interested in any of this. And over and over and over again through faculty and through my peers and through just a bunch of other people, when I tell them about this, they all seem very interested in it. And so I've learned to, to trust in, you know, what feels honest and what feels true and to just go in that direction. All right, thank you. We are really pleased to introduce, I'm pleased to introduce Saron Alderson, uh, who was born in, uh, in, in New Jersey and is now based in Houston. 
Alderson received an associate's degree in fashion from Fashion Institute of Technology in New York before completing uh, her Bachelor of Science degree in England at the Nottingham uh, Trenton. Trenton University. Yes. Thank you. And, uh, and then uh, is now pursuing uh, a degree focusing on painting and in printmaking uh, for her MFA at the School of Art at the University of Houston. Uh, Saran's work has been featured in numerous exhibitions at El locally at Elton Street Studio and Black for Art Museum, but also at uh, Vincent Price Art Museum in Los Angeles. During her time at UH, uh, Alderson has served as a, t a teaching fellow in both printmaking and painting. Welcome. Thank you so much. Y'all, thank you so much for coming out. I'm super excited. Let's get into the flesh of it, huh? So yeah, my name's Saran Alderson, and this is my homage to all of the things that are weird and wonderful about being a human being, about living in these like impossible meat sacks, like that somehow work and that are kind of similar to each other, but completely different, but still function in the same way. Like what, who, how, what? Yes. And not enough has been made about how just beautiful and glamorous and wonderful all of us are, even down to our simplest, teeny tiniest little pubic hairs. Like everything about us can be really awesome and beautiful if we just look at it from a different perspective. So, um, I don't know if you can tell I'm obsessed with the figure. I've always been obsessed with the figure. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I was a nerd. I went to school like before school, then I went to school after school. And then on the weekends, I would take the train by myself, my little 14 year old self into Manhattan on New Jersey transit. I would take classes in New York City Saturday and Sunday, like a big fat nerd. And finally ran out of like fashion design classes to take. Cause I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be a fashion designer. Um, and ended up signing up for this like class called Life Drawing. No idea what that was. Kind of walked in, get 14 year olds up, la 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 la. And then model comes in, nude. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh everyone else is cool with this? Okay, me too. Um, and since that day, I picked up that pencil, tried to figure out the figure, and I was good at it. Like everything else in the whole world, I kind of sucked at a little bit and I had to try really hard to get good at. But this, I picked it up and we were at one with each other. And so that moment of joy has like been a line that has like followed me throughout my life. And I'm so glad that I found my way back to it again. And now I get to make, I get to make giant titties on the wall. I get to make huge crotches with fatty cellulite that looks amazing with stitched up stretch marks. I get to twist bits of metal to look like pubic hair and put them on a shelf. Yeah, and why do I do that? Because honestly, we're all a little bit grossed out when we see a pubic hair in the wild and we know that it's not ours. But what's great about that, it's a communal disgust. Like you standing next to the person next to you are all like, oh, did you see that? Isn't that gross? Oh my God, I saw a pubic hair the other day. Oh my God, me too. You don't know this person. I love that. Yes. So this is about joy. This is about brush strokes. This is about reconnecting with joy as much as humanly possible because this world is hard. We make plans and the universe laughs in our face. And these are me reacting to all of the things, all of the movements, all of the gestures. I sit in front of a model, right? In a traditional figure drawing session. And I do these little graphite drawings, right? And they're quick. They're a gesture. The model, she moves, I move. The model, he moves, I move. And so it's about this partner dance between me and the model, right? So I'm doing these gestures. I'm making these notations of this moment that I'm sitting here in front of the model. And then I'm all like, well, now that I have a stack this big of drawings, WTF, what do I do with all of it? Well, this, okay? So printmaking, drawing, painting really experimenting with all of the different ways. And one of the great things about printmaking is there's these processes in place, right? There are these rules that you have to follow. However, you make plans, the universe laughs, okay? You, you never know really what's about to happen. And that like wonderful moment where you have to improvise and figure out how to fix what has just gone wrong, why this print is salty, what can I do to this and that? 
Like, that is the beautiful moment. It's not about like, be like, oh, my pressure, I haven't gotten it quite pink enough. It's never pink enough. And so this is my homage. Um, also, I really like the idea too, like, so we've got a lot of the body. I'm clearly obsessed with the hair. I mean, have you seen this hair? I'm obsessed with hair. I'm obsessed with hair. I'm obsessed with hair. I'm obsessed with hair, all of it. Uh, so I've actually drawn parts of uh, body hair onto glass. And this way we can also find ways to suggest the human body without actually showing the human body. What? Yeah, because you know what? Your armpit hair, that shit's beautiful too. Um, yeah. Now that you've seen my manifesto, see me do a tap dance, kick my shoes up, my shoes are great, look at them. Um, are there any questions or concerns or anything anyone wants to hear? I think there's gonna be a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, Charisma, do you have one? Uh, sure, hold on, I have, I have a note. Yeah. Ooh. In the meantime. <laughs> yeah. There was a question over there. If okay, you a moment. Start, let's, let's have someone else start. Raise your hand and, and I'm, get. I'm really interested in this cluster of forms and your decision to put them in the corner. Can you talk about how that happened? Yeah, so uh, I'm really like literal, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm like a nerd literal, like the public, the pubic hairs or whatever, like they really came from me, like picking up a hairnet that somebody was working with and like laughing at it, saying that it looks like pubic hair because I'm 12 on the inside. Uh, and I went to text somebody that it was like pubic hair was falling that day and it auto-corrected to public hair. And I was like, oh! <laughs> so now these private hairs, they're public. So same thing with this corner, right? Super literal. Like I was having a hard time in the studio. I was like, oh, painting is so hard. I keep planning and the painting never works out. Why? Um, and then like I started doing printmaking and then there was something about printmaking, being able to be okay with the stuff not going right and working with it. It made me turn a corner. <laughs> yeah, you guys, literal. Charisma. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. So I was just curious, you talked a little bit about it, that you have all of these uh, different pieces. So I was just wondering, is there more to the significance of the use of a salon style to display all of these works? Yeah, so um, I'm really interested in the fact that throughout art history, right, like, Typically, the human body, like the people who have been responsible for making works about the human body, have been straight white guys. Hey, you guys are great. Everybody's great. However, with their gaze, a lot of things have had been on different hierarchies. What's most important? What's least important? What's human? What's subhuman? And with this kind of configuration, I'm trying to like change up the hierarchy of the parts of the body. Um, nothing really is higher than anything else. Everything that's on this wall is represented almost three different times. The original drawing that it came from, um, an iteration of it maybe as a painting or a print, a ghost of that print, or another technique being done with it. So everything can be something if you just look at it differently. And I think that's kind of what I'm attempting to do here. Yes, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like your work delves into like a lot of things that like I feel like are pretty like stigmatized. Like when I think about like pubic hair and mm -hmm. like boobs and private parts, like obviously we're in a room of people who are all really accepting. Like I think it's really cool, but like I have made art like since I was you know, maybe fourteen as well, like depicting similar things, obviously mm -hmm. not to the same extent, but I was met with such backlash. And I could yeah. not I could never have the excitement and the joy about mm -hmm. it and like I think it's so impressive and wonderful that you have it, but I just, my question is, how do you just like, how are you just so yourself about this kind of thing? Like what makes you feel so comfortable about something that is like, because when I saw it in the corner, my thought was like, it's in the corner because that's the deepest corner of the body. Ooh. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> You get a little numb when people keep ki kicking you in the crotch, right? Like you don't feel it anymore when people keep all like, that's stupid, did you check the shoes? They're great. Um, so really it's about like, it's the same thing here, right? Like you might get like, people might get freaked out by seeing a dick, right? Um, and yet I'm all like dick, 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 dick. And then after a while, there's enough dicks out there that like you don't even see it as a dick anymore, right? It becomes just a shape. And so it really was a case of like enough people like telling me what they thought it was and me being like, it's not that. It's really about like having to like 
hear enough times from people growing up that like, oh, you know, you'd be pretty if you just lost some weight or, you know, you know, like, you know, you would be a lot cooler if you had darker skin, like you could fit in more, like, you know, all of these things about my, my personal being, like if you just did this or if you were just different or if you were just born a different fucking way, like maybe you might be something or do something bigger or better. And I finally had to be all like, we're about to curse on camera. Fuck you. <laughs> and then you can get to a place with hot pink. <laughs> yes, Joe. Um, and you know, I took my granddaughter to one of your shows down the road. Yeah. And you know how I can be pretty liberal and you know, dicks are dicks, big deal. But I have these daughter, or these granddaughters, who are starting to realize about their appearance and what it means to the world and how that matters. You know, maybe one of these and that, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is, <clears throat> Yeah. Yes. So, okay. We are, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Our bodies, they work. They do an amazing thing. Like we breathe without thinking, right? We have skin that somehow covers all of these internal mechanisms. The fact that we like exist and we're functioning and we're cognitive and even when we're not cognitive, like we are just impressive machines. So, it doesn't matter if you've got breasts, it doesn't matter if you have a dick, it doesn't matter if your butt's big or small, like you exist, you take up space, and like all of the individual parts of you are not the whole of you. And I think really like worrying about what the whole of you is, doesn't matter what happens here. Like I would be the same person, well maybe I wouldn't be the same person if I had small titties versus big titties, like, like but it really is about like realizing how crucially amazing it is that we, these are meat sacks. How are we expressing ourselves? How are we hugging each other? How are we crying? How are we dealing with grief? How are we finding joy in every little moment that we can? That was wordy. I don't, you know, cool. check the chance. Get <laughs> <laughs> what else you got? All right, I think that's a good ending. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Um, one of them that I wanted to talk about is um, the uh, existence of psychogenic tears. So um, is it okay if I actually move? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, psychogenic tears are, there's a difference, there's three types of tears. There's basal tears, which lubricate your eye. There's reflex tears, which um, occur when something irritating happens. And then there are psychogenic tears, which are sparked by emotion. And psychogenic tears are different because they contain natural painkillers um, that are not found in other parts of the body. So if you were to actually eat your tears, you might get like a very tiny percentage of relief. Um, so, so my artwork is a system of artwork talking about um, the existence and the sparking of psychogenic tears. So this first piece here is called uh, Silence Cello, Cello Silenced. And um, it is the inciting moment of when psychogenic tears get sparked. So something happens. The creative child is silenced. The artist is not allowed to express. Um, something happens to spark these tears. And then the tears feed the body. Um, and then here, this body here uh, represents the human body. And um, you can see the tears uh, as they are um, on the muffler. And um, so once, um, once someone chooses whether or not to muffle their tears or not, um, there is, um, sorry, I just have to look at this really quick. I took very extensive notes. Um, um, once a person is emotionally activated and in need of crying, they choose to muffle their tears or not. So this is kind of the process of, of being an immigrant a bit. Um, and uh, the more muffled the tears get, the more they change over time. So the tears, they start off really light, airy, um, clear. Uh, and the more and more muffled they get, they get heavier, they get more rusty, they get um, full of sediment. And um, my gallery guide that I offer outside of the uh, gallery talks about uh, this word I came up with called feralization. It's a made up word, I made it up. Um, and it's from the Portuguese word enferrujado, which means rusty. Um, but it also, I wanted it to uh, mean a bit more than that. So I wanted it to be a bit poetic. Um, so feralized also means to be feral or let something be feral. So the tears, once you've muffled them so much that um, it's hard to contain them, they do become feral and they become hard to control. Um, so then we come here next and this is self-care. So self-care is at the center of this process and it's at the center of everything. Um, it, I wanted to think of like, if you were in a dark hole, how would you climb yourself out of that? And I was thinking of, of all of those old cartoons where they tie bed sheets to each other to you know, escape a kidnapper or run out of a burning building or something. And I thought, why can't we do that emotionally? Why can't we do that with tissues, Kleenex tissues? So these tissues are here kind of in a way to talk about how you can climb yourself out of the hole you're in. Um, so that is uh, self-care. And then the very next one is the reverse feralization. So we've seen this feralization here. Um, and the reverse feralization is when um, the, the sediments, the tears, go from very dark and heavy and, and, and uh, sedimented and rusty to uh, back to how they originally were, which is clear and easy to cry and mix with your basal and reflex tears. And after a person has learned how to um, take care of themselves and cry and all of that, they are met in exaltation, um, which is this beautiful birdcage here. I think I'm allowed to say beautiful. <laughs> um, and it actually makes a noise. And if it falls apart, that's okay. That is okay because it has been falling apart. And that's okay, that's part of the process as well. Um, so I can go ahead and shake that if, if you
of crying oneself out of their cage. Um, the story behind this is that I actually had a bird named Rocky who um, I was fostering, and he hated me so much. Birds are very sensitive. Um, and um, he hated me so much that he made so many cries and so many groans that I eventually called the lady up and I said, I'm sorry, fostering Rocky isn't going to work. He hates it here. And he cried himself out of his cage. So um, as you can see, the cage is still closed, but it's been open. Um, and the very last piece in the system is uh, this piece here called All of the Above which is to say that anyone who wants um, emotional exaltation is worthy of getting it. Um, and um, a couple of things about this piece, I wanted to say that um, gender is a trap if you only approach it from one way, but if you use it as a source of scaffolding and support, since it's made of an old bed frame, it can really be a source of, of like I was saying, support um, to your life and that anyone who wants to learn how to emotionally regulate, uh, you are worthy of receiving a psychoeducation on that. Um, and that self-care is for everyone. <laughs> and I think that's it. How much did you envision this journey um, from the start? You have your, um, your helpful you know, map that shows us all the different steps, but did you envision each of these steps and, and then, um, or did you have some of these sculptures in play? Uh, like, uh, there, there's so much materiality and objects and construction in the work. Like, how did those things play together? How did the planning of the concept and then the response to the materials work in your work? So the concept started with these three right here. Um, the muffler, the exhaust pipe, and the reverse feralization. Uh, it started with these three, and then I realized that I had other pieces that spoke to the process, um, and they belong together in this whole system. Uh, so it started with these three, and it just started as a way to um, be able to manifest and digest my own internal processes that were happening at the time. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yes. So I noticed that. Yes, I think doors represent so much. Doors, of course, represent like, um, to me, I think they represent eternity, endless possibilities, uh, so many opportunities. So I want the human body to be resting on a possibility. Um, that's what I wanted. <laughs> yes, Kat? I was totally going to ask about that door. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, I actually played a bunch of instruments growing up. My mom wanted me to be a musician. My sister was a musician, but I could never stick to any instruments. Instead, I just like to take things apart. <laughs> so um, I wanted that to be music. So the cello looks like music when you look at it, but the birdcage actually makes music when you shake it. So I, I just like sound. I like all kinds of sound. Yes. Uh, I noticed inside of your cello piece that there's uh, texture and objects uh, in, like, in the inside. Can you talk about this confuse of the inside of the cello? Yes. So I wanted to make like a visual massage for people to look at. Um, I want their eyeballs to be surrounded by the most beautiful textures to just massage your eyeballs and the way I, my eyeballs get massaged is by looking at repetitive textures. So I took a glue gun and I made as many textures on the inside as I possibly could. I wanted it to look like a forbidden fruit. Like when you break an artist open, it's like a Venus flytrap or something. Like you don't know what you're going to get in there. <laughs> yes, Stephen. Um, I'm actually looking for homes to put them in. So if I don't find homes to put them in, I'm going to have to chop them up again and, and make them even smaller or do something else. So I definitely am going to have to um, find a way to 
store them and do something like that. But I'm not shy to, to get rid of things or throw things away. <laughs> uh, I'm not shy to do that because I know I can always make something again. Yeah, so I really, really wanted um, language to be a big part of this. Text is a huge, huge um, influence in my artwork. And um, when I created the studio notes, which is kind of a roadmap so that people kind of know what's going on, they don't have to take away from it exactly what I want them to. But I wanted the words to be a sort of uh, roadmap, so to speak, to um, to which people can use as a sort of scaffolding to understand the artwork. So text is very important to me and I feel like I'm really glad the museum let me make um, little handouts because uh, that is like number seven. There's six pieces here but the handout is like piece number seven. Um, and I just hope that people, if people really, really, really want to get deep into it, I want that to be fulfilling to them. So I offer that there um, in case they really want to think about it. So what's next? Like, does this work inspiring other new ideas? Um, so far, what's next is I'm going to get a job. <laughs> um, and from there, I'm going to keep my art practice. And my sister has claimed two of these pieces, and the other ones are looking for homes. So that is what's next, and just trying to reconnect with my community, because being the, one of the best things about grad school is the people you meet. So I hope to hang out with more people. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Lila Bispo. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, the, our next artist today is Viola Thule, who is a Venezuelan art and Lebanese uh, conceptual artist who is based in New York and in Houston. Uh, you'll begin her uh, artistic journey in the arts with the theater and later became interested in ph photography. Uh, she studied photography at the Escuela uh, Ar Arquitectura de Fotografía in Mexico uh, City and is currently pursuing an MFA in Interdisciplinary Practice in Emergency for Emerging Forms at the School of Art. Buell has been part of several exhibitions, including at the Blacker uh, <laughs> Carriers <laughs> last year, um, and solo exhibitions at the Art League of Houston uh, and, and uh, other in a residency in, where was the residency you were just telling me? Uh, Cornell. At Cornell. So, welcome. Thank you. Um, I don't know what to start. <laughs> <laughs> so, my practice and my process is a lim uh, liminal space between uh, art making and living making. Um, I have a struggle talking about my identity. I don't, I, being forced lately to say that I'm a, a Venezuelan, Lebanese, <coughs> queer, and all that things that it has identified me in a way to be able to get into a institutional narrative. So I'm questioning all those, uh, um, let's say, concepts or. Uh, languages uh, for us to work in within the institutions. Um, in my practice, I I build my work on um, economical and social vulnerabilities to create uh, political empowerment. So when I'm talking about political empowerment, I'm talking about knowledge, about have information, data, and starts to. Um, 
to confront what is what is really happening. Um, I, uh, and then during my the, my learning process as an MFA student, I I was interested in learn and unlearn all these concepts related to territorialities, uh, belonging, and unbelonging. And so that's why I create this installation. As I say, I started as a, in theater when I was really young. I'm impressed that my dad is in there. <laughs> um, I'm not based in New York. I'm barely based in Houston, and I don't like to be based in anywhere. Um, I uh, I started yeah with with I, I just right now when Stephen told me like you can put a blanket. <laughs> I I remember one of my first uh, work, which is uh, a work that I did in Venezuela when I was doing creating this mise en scène about potholes in the street. So I have a I have a an, an a scenario of a beach in the middle of the street. So I just remember that was the last time in 2009 where I used sand. So I like to create um, installations and use materiality to create a bridge between the, uh, the uh, spectator and the ideas that I'm trying to develop. Um, also for me, the spectator is uh, basically like the 50% of the, the component of my, of my work. Uh, I need the spectator to be part of and activate uh, what I'm doing. And then to talk about this installation, uh, against representation comes from a, in the beginning of, is it like a wink to against interpretation by Susan Sontag uh, essay. So I, then, I, then I add the end and then I change it to representation because as a Venezuelan, now to use it in a proper way, I don't have anything that I can consider to have an institutional representation. Um, when I think that I'm doing a project about a passport, Venezuelan passport, I'm thinking, well, but that's too Venezuelan, that's too local. But also, I try to create this project from a very personal experience to raise awareness about how population and a population no, sorry, uh, populism and um, polarization in any country is so dangerous. So um, for example, uh, against representation also address uh, Microviolence. I'm very interested in think about uh, how we are used to naturalize violence and small cases of violence, like in the case that I have to do so many things and pay a lot of money to get a passport. So that happened in a in a tiny standard of what society problems have. So. It's, for me, it's very inter it's, it's something that I'm very interested in, and pick up on all those details. And I think that's my photography mind to take details like this kind of microviolence and put it there, so people can think about those things. I like to use humor. I like to use satirical. I like to use playfulness to engage the spectator in it, in the in the game. And to talk about, in this case, this machine is a tricky machine that will take more of your money, of your money than the possibility to get a passport. So I often say, people that ask me, what, oh, I have a Venezuelan passport. Yeah, you can sell it in the black market. So that's, they're still in the same kind of uh, stew, right? So yeah, for me, that's, uh, that's things that are interesting and then also, again, I know I said something about it, but materiality is it's a, it's a, it's a key in my work. And uh, yeah, and um, I just want to say that for Venezuelan to get a passport is $300, and the minimum wage for Venezuelan is $30 per month. 
And if you get an appointment to get a passport, it can be you can get that appointment, you can get the date for that appointment in eight months, a year, you don't ever know. Now, how that work. So um, I'm working a lot in the uh, in the subject of identity and try to place the, the spectator and myself and also the piece of art as a as a new ways to frame uh, this concept of identity and make it on you know, frame it and fluent and with other possibilities. So I think that's so this work is really interactive. Um, and can you tell us about some of the components of it? Yeah, so for example, that piece is that we have, we as Venezuelan in, in a very ironic way, we are able to organize ourselves in chat groups to find ways to get a passport in an easy way. So I'm part of 40 different uh, chat groups where I'm following what's going on with the passport, because also that's part of the tricky thing that the, the, the bureaucratic behind it, instead of organize, disorganize the, the process to get a passport. So we have these groups where people are saying how and, and how and how much and what to do to get, a, to get a passport. So people are trying to help each other. And I'm amazed at how we can be so organized to that, but not to create a political and social change. So that piece is only one chat group conversation where you can see, you can read, it's in Spanish, but you can read information or disinformation about how to get a passport, what to do, go early, go late, uh, don't forget to bring the umbrella, and if it's cold here, it's not, now it's not $80, it's $120, and, and so on. And the, the other piece that is below, uh, below the, the wall text, with, with a, I just blocked the, the sound because it's, it's a, I don't know if that word in English exists, cacophony, cacophony, yeah. So um, I, in those group, I, I have been in contact because um, this project became after my dad passed and I couldn't see him because I didn't have a pass for, for six years and I've been working on that lately. Um, and then I got in contact with different fraudulent uh, situation and people that is offer me like to get a passport for three thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars and all that. So that I tried to keep it like you cannot understand what's going on because that is the way our unconscious mind it is right now. So yeah, that's the two components. The other thing I just have to ask about is the sand. Yeah, um, I wanted to create a, this topic, uh, a scenario, and I think I will, if I have more space, I will get crazy, more crazy, more sad. <laughs> and, um, but the thing is that uh, when you walk on the sand, it's unstable. Uh, we think that the sand and the desert belongs to the state in Mexico situation. Like, for example, uh, oh, this is the desert, and then the desert is where people from, like we call them Mexican to all the people that turn across to the United States. So uh, for us lately, for Venezuelans, um, now the desert is part of our path. And we have uh, campaments, people, campaments? Yeah, in campus, yeah, uh, of Venezuela living in the desert, and also I got stuck in Juarez for a few months. And after I have six years with a pass without a passport, then I went to the American Embassy to get a visa to be able to get in and back into into United States, and then they took my passport, and it was like Ooh, scary. And then and then uh, I got in different situation in Juarez where. I, what I also would say that the desert have more than than just uh, address a cartography. Um, yeah, the sun it means. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. 
question. I know it's kind of hard because um, you all are kind of all over the place. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm very intrigued by this aerial view that seems to be like a desert. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, to know uh, a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's a. When I, when I was pending uh, in Mexico for, for five months, I, flo I flew mm -hmm. to uh, Ciudad Juarez. So that's the Chihuahua Desert. And I went to the desert and I have a whole, um, I have a whole uh, series of photographs that I did. And then there's also a series of poems that I wrote with this series. Mm -hmm. And there's just also a, a sentence that it's, um, it's uh, like, it's just a sentence to say, a mandatory choreography in lines and chairs, and that's the moment when you have to be like standing in the line, and then they spit out here, and they move to another chair, and then it was, it is all related to that uh, experience. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you said that your work is about framing your identity as a femininity. But I also want to ask um, if your work kind of takes into consideration the politics and the chaotic ways that people in Latin America live and what people usually have to do and the process you have to go through and the corruption and the yeah and everything that goes into leaving these countries that are you know people that are looking for better lives in the U.S. or so. So do you think this work kind of with that idea as well, mm -hmm. or did your work in general kind of talk about that chaotic um, yes. process? Yes, it's um, framing more than framing myself in, in there. But yeah, I mean, I, what, one of the things that I like is sometimes people is not seeing what's going on, you just want to play the game. You know, to just see them like, oh, you have a couple of what? And, then get, and I use a lot of game machines in my work. So that's also talk about the, the, the culture of consumers. And so yes, definitely it's not just a, it's not just in Latin America, it's also here. We, we see that here. We, we, we see um, how um, uh, populism is taking over and mm -hmm. the polarization and that brings a lot of chaotic situations. And then this piece is just about how tricky it can be in the system. So yeah, absolutely. Oh, everything, and then microviolence, like again, that's a, I don't know if it's micro when you put it all together, but when you see like everyone has a story to tell, like I was 11 hours trying to get my license, or I was stopped by the border police and I have my papers, but he also got me stay there for three hours because he was not trusting in me and he weren't trusting me. So, but, um, but yeah, it's those kind of things that I like to address. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, like, can you talk a, a little bit about sort of shaping the architecture as well? Mm -hmm. um, because you know, you could have just left this an open space, but I feel like sort of the condensing or the narrowing of space, you, know, you mm -hmm. kind of open the space with the projection. Like, I'm just curious about how you sort of create that architectural mm -hmm. element to sort of elaborate or amplify some of the other pieces of the work. Yeah, thank you for that. Nice. Well, I have to be that I. I have to say that I was sure because I wanted to put a revolving door. I wanted to put something that you had to, you know, walk the line to be able to get here and, and you know, make violence the spectator more, even more that you had to wait and walk in there. So the idea of lock the, the space is also to uh, make a kind of a walk and then you have to get in from the same uh, space and go out and uh, and also at the moment that we did the opening it was crowded so people was like trying to get in and get out and then it's the same kind of crowd that I found in in Mexico City when I went to when I get my appointment so I wanted to create more uh, difficulty as 
just the experiences, the real experience for us. But yes, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Um, I know you said that the, the idea behind it is to really focus on how tricky it can be um, to get one. So I guess my question is, is there a chance that you could get one even though it's tricky? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what happened the day the, the day we opened? I was here talking with people in Spain, you know, what is this and that? And then I heard other people like, whoa, screaming. And then I, when, I, when I turned around, and I saw a girl with a pastor in her hand. And she said, I'm a Venezuelan. I said, no way. <laughs> so there's, there's three, I, I know that three or four people got a pastor. Uh, I have a question. Sure. I'm curious. Uh, it's very hard to get a Venezuelan password in the real world. Yes. <laughs> and here. Uh, but how strong is the Venezuelan password? If you get it, you can then leave the country easily. I mean, for Why me. Why they are making comments? Uh, well, there's the. Okay, three things I'm going to say. Uh, I was thinking, like, what about if I put American passport or. European passport, mm -hmm. but I'm just talking about my right as a Venezuelan to get a passport. Okay. So that's why I decided to go just with Venezuela. Mm -hmm. It's useless. As, okay. the, <laughs> as, as the Lebanese, <laughs> for us, like, a, you sure you want to say you're a Lebanese? <laughs> so, um, but uh, it, it used for me to, to get the, the visa. Okay. Uh, United States artist visa, which is the one I oh, have yeah. here. You need the passport. So I need yeah. I need some support to put the stamp on. <laughs> so that's the only that's the only reason. No, because uh, I'm I'm from Iran and it's just yeah. in Tehran now you can get passport less than a week. Uh huh. Uh, because you cannot go. In. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then the other thing is uh, that they're stop. preventing. <laughs> The, the other thing that I forgot to say that they're preventing, they make it harder and harder for Venezuelans that are outside of the country to not go to Venezuela and vote against mm -hmm. the regime. Okay. So that now that is the uh, election are coming, elections are coming, uh, they're changing the whole platform. So everything that I have here is, is not working. working anymore. So people is finding new ways to, sure yeah. And then, for example, my mom born in Senegal, and she have a, a document for France, a French uh, uh, Partida de Nacimiento, like the, the birth, birth, birth certificate, and she never changed her identity to French. She went to Venezuela, and then she um, she have a Venezuelan passport living in Mexico. But her passport expired, and she's been waiting for three years for her passport to be able to take the uh, the money or everything that my dad left. So it's like she 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 cannot even come to to the United States. She have a visa, but she have, she have a, a passport. So she's been yeah. in almost three years in situation. Yeah. Yeah, our yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I just think we have been, this has been wonderful. You want to just quickly say if, if what's next for you? Okay. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to bother everybody. No. <laughs> I um, I'm just keep my practice now. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Thank Working you so time. much. <laughs> okay, welcome to our next speaker uh, of the of the day. Um, I'd love uh, it's my privilege to introduce Mandana Banjbar Tashma Shorki, and, and uh, she grew up in Tehran, Iran where she received her undergraduate degree in software engineering at the Center for Science and Technology of Building and Urban Development uh, of Tehran. Uh, Ranjbar is completed her MFA, uh, or she's completing her MFA with a concentration in photography from the School of Art at U of H, 
and has shown her, her work in the Blaffer Art Museum and in the Elgin Street Studios here in Houston and around the world in Iran uh, at the University of, of Arab, uh, United Arab, oh sorry, the United Arab Emirates and in Italy. She received, uh, uh, she recently curated Women, Life, Freedom exhibition in Houston in response to the ongoing atrocities against uh, the people of Iran. Can you tell us a little bit about that exhibit? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, should I start with that? Yeah. Well, you don't have to, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> I will. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here today with me. Um, I would like to start by appreciating the director of School of Art, its faculties, and Blaffer staff. I mean, without their support and their help, I wasn't here to talk about my art. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I would prefer to talk about the show later that I curated, uh, but I want to start to share my journey with you, what the, you know, got me here as a photographer and I'm leaving here as an artist. So, uh, long story short, I'm Mandana. I was born in Iran, Tehran, capital of Iran. And if you believe luck, I believe I was lucky enough to born in open-minded family and supportive family. That's why I'm here to talk about freedom, which I really care about it. So, and also, Again, I was lucky enough to touch camera when I was three, four years old. Uh, my dad had a camera and I took the first photograph that time. Maybe it inspired me to be a photographer. But you know, parent, I mean, I became an engineer. <laughs> so at the same time, I'm not gonna go through that story, but um, I started my professional journey in photography in my 20s uh, with photojournalism. But it was shocked uh, for me first time in the society that I, you know, belong to, I saw a lot of, you know, gender apartheid and, you know, made me really upset at the first and curious because I, as I used to grow in this way, I'm asking why, why? And then, so I just realized it's not really easy to censor what I want to say, what I want to share as a photojournalist. I switched uh, in theater photography and I focused on art and culture, it was a great opportunity for me to know more about my people, especially women and how they struggle, you know, for the basic rights. So, you know, taking photograph in theater scene and stage gave me opportunity to know more light, more know about stage and directing in a way you want to. And I decided, okay, I can make my scene and be narrative about, you know, all concern and worries and difficulties that they think it's out there. The other people they're dealing with, they're living with, and they don't have a chance to share. So maybe I can do it and I can be their voice. So yeah, that's why I'm here. I started this journey in Iran. I made several photo series about, you know, captivity women in their life after, you know, during the marriage, then when they don't have any opportunity to follow their dream and their desire. So, but unfortunately, I never got a chance to show those kind of work in my hometown. So maybe we can, can see there, this is a really great, I mean, path to me to share the voice of all the women across the world with all the people here in the United States and more than that. So I came here, I applied for the grad school, I got accepted, COVID hit. Okay, just imagine. <laughs> so, and I knew I need to work on what I want to, women's concern, but I, at the same time, I knew I need to find a universal topic, which is kind of like, you know, uh, easier to communicate with American people here. Uh, 2020 in December, uh, I opened Instagram and I saw a news Guardian published, uh, Argentina uh, legalized abortion rights for women 
as a third, you know, Latin American country. And I was like, okay, I think I got what I need. That's a really good topic, but honestly, I was really far. And I was like, there is Google. I can, you know, find what I want to do. So I started um, with this topic to just need to move a little bit with this piece. It's the first photograph that I got for this in touching topic. Um, the way I made it, I just started to think about, okay, I'm a woman, how I feel if I think I don't have a freedom to make a decision about my body. That's my personal feeling, even though I never experienced, but I knew no one doesn't want to, you know, be in the, that situation and, you know, feel kind of like trapped, kind of like a unwanted creatures, which is a little bit, I mean, it's beautiful, I like it, but <laughs> of course it's not really good to feel it in your body. So, and honestly at that point I thought, okay, I just did what I want to because I wasn't ready to do series. I knew it's hard, but, uh, and also I was in grad school, uh, I really want to explore the other medium, sculpture, but 2022, when I was about ready to make a decision about my thesis, I mean, something happened in the United States, you all know about it, Supreme Court overruled, you know, Roe versus Wade, and I was shocked. I was like, oh, okay, uh, it's a kind of like a touching topic and sensitive, especially it's in terms of timing, maybe I need to continue. This topic calls me, and I mean, okay, I can do it, yes. Um, I shared it my chair, uh, she accepted, and I started to interview with different women who have experience and who has a voice they want to share with the world. So it was a really tough part of this project because we cried together, we laughed together, and we shared a lot of inner personal feelings and I was like, oh my God, um, how I can convey all these feelings to my art. Uh, that's why it was tough and it got a long time. Uh, but I was like, okay, maybe I need to give a credit to all people who helped me and um, you know, bring their presence in the show because, I mean, because of them and because of their voice, it happened. I continue to the sketches and I decided to develop this photograph and you know made photo series to just say it's not about you know women who are young who are not white all women you know it, it doesn't really matter about their race color I mean age or whatever we want to separate people that I hated anyways so yeah, I made this series and I was about to make a sculpture, which I really wanted to do, but it was a challenge and magic happened here because um, most of the time I'm trying to make a surreal scene in my photograph and I was like, I need to convey this, you know, uh, feelings about making surreal scene to the sculpture, which is a 3D dimension. At the first, it wasn't easy at all but uh, I did it. So, and how I made this sculpture, uh, during the research, I came across with Jerry Santaro, the first American woman who we know, you know, who died. The reason I'm saying the first, uh, it's important we know her, you know, a lot of women died before her, but, in 1964, she died because of unsafe abortion in a model room and her lover left her. So after nine years, 1973, uh, Miss Magazine published her photograph and her sister realized her. And she was upset at the first, but very soon she changed her mind and she just believed, oh, my sister, she's an icon for this movement and she became supportive for women's rights. And I have a photograph of her, I mean, police uh, photograph her and her body. I made a collage uh, with that photograph, which is kind of like violence. 
and I add some of my, you know, photograph that I, like I said, started to think about this and all the consequences for the women. Um, that collage, you know, came up and then I was like, okay, right now I know a lot of women before Jerry, they died and they never got a chance to share their voice with the world. So that's why I do have the space to say, um, I mean, if we don't want to support women and, you know, be their voice, you know, it's happening, unfortunately, today in the United States, which make, which make me really upset because I believe uh, we're going forward, but it seems, you know, history trying, trying to push us back, which I think we don't want to. So, yeah, it's pretty much about, you know, all these pieces and about the exhibition that I uh, curated. Um, recently, probably f most of you know about it, in Iran, a revolution started, and we do have a famous chant, a woman, life, freedom. And freedom is a word, is a key word that I'm looking, and I want to highlight it and say, freedom should be human right. So, and I just gave a proposal to School of Art, you know, confirmed, and I curated the show with a group of artists, uh, mostly Houston based, to respond to the current situation that's happening in Iran. It was a really great collaboration, and I was honored to curate that show. And I had a piece, uh, you can see, when you're going downstairs, you know, I made it to support my people, my country, and again, woman, life, freedom. Well, thank you, and thanks for uh, also, you know, explaining the, the, the beginning of the evolution of this series. One thing is, um, can you kind of talk about, uh, we, we can't all see it from this view, but also the, the tables. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, okay. I need to share a secret. I mean, Flapper, don't be upset, but uh, when, <laughs> when we had a meeting, I uh, shared, I do have a video, but I just realized, you know, in this space, uh, there is no good place to show the video. That's why I applied Plan B. Uh, the video was about, you know, Persian culture and our new year, uh, which is uh, Nowruz. And we do have this arrangement, we call it half scene. So the reason I wanna put this video in the show because uh, I installed the work, especially, I mean, exactly during the Persian New Year. You know, it was our New Year, I was here to install. I just called my family, I was like, oh, happy New Year, <laughs> I just need to come back to the work. So it was valuable to me and also, because that video was really, I mean, uh, successful uh, for the other people who didn't know anything about the culture. And I thought, mm, why not? I can put all the arrangement here and share, you know, Persian New Year with American people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Um, questions from the. Uh, yes and no. The reason I said yes, I mean, back then, like, you need to go, like, 200 ago, uh, in our culture, they believe yellow brings hate. But not these days. I mean, I mean, I really like yellow I wear it, right? <laughs> so, but I was like, I can borrow that, you know, tout and apply to my work because in the United States, it doesn't mean like this, you know, it means, like, it's kind of like a happy color, you know, has a life. And I thought that's a really good contrast, you know, be between what I'm seeing, people who died, a surreal scene, and sharp yellow color. So yeah, it was intentional, and it was another kind of like a mild yellow, and I was like, no, I want a brighter, and I changed it, and it's a final result here. <laughs> Related to that, can you talk about your use of light and dark in the work? Uh, like. Just in general, the light, the, you know, the, the figures are really in relief. They look almost Baroque in their lighting and, you know, your use of lighting. 
yes, I think um, for sure, uh, theatrical photography uh, helped me a lot. Uh, even though I wasn't, I mean, a person who <laughs> you know does all the arrangement, but I mean, you can learn. And I spent more than ten years uh, in that field. Yeah, uh, and you can see that signature. You know. I'm carrying and applying to you know the scene that I'm making that I'm directing, and um, I would say yeah I see my model as an actress and I can't ask them you know what I'm looking for, but I would say for this specific project I was lucky enough because uh, most of the you know collaboration went well even though we spent a lot of time but it was a really great experience and I, I mean, to compare with the other project that I made, it was, uh, like I said, tough in terms of, you know, sharing um, real experience, but with taking photograph, it was smooth, which I appreciated. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, you touched my heart. I mean, um, I have a lot to share about this question, but um, uh, I need to, I mean, be careful, especially as an artist here. I mean, I'm a rebel artist, you know, but, <laughs> but um, there's a lot going on, especially in terms of, you know, this conflict, you know, having freedom here in the Middle East, you know, I believe we are all human and freedom it should be human right. But in politics, it's a kind of like different story. It's a theater, exactly, you know, they're playing their role. So it's hard to talk about it because sometimes, you know, we don't know what's going on behind the scene, but we can see, you know, all the stuff, you know, it's happening. Like I said, uh, Right now, as an Iranian American, you know, woman, I'm standing here, so I need to be careful about both sides. You know, I cannot take a side. But in general, as a human, it really doesn't matter. You know, free, freedom, it's for all of us, but it's not happening in a way it should be. That's, I mean, uh, where I'm standing about, you know, this question. I hope we get the chance to emphasize our voice together because I believe we're stronger together. Okay. And what's next for you artistically? Uh, that's a hard question. <laughs> uh, for sure. I mean, I still want to, you know, focus on my practice and be an uh, activist. Uh, and more, make more art uh, because, I mean, we do have a lot of topic. Uh, and I know a lot of different artists, activists, they talked about it, but I really want to, you know, uh, explore in the other field. And I think I still have a lot with this project. I mean, I'm tired, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I will continue my practice as an artist. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mandana. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, this is final speaker for today and actually for this series of three-day artist talks. Uh, we will welcome uh, Katie Potsky. Uh, Katie Potsky, its work centers upon history and historical artifacts, both ancient and modern, an interest that led Potsky to uh, receive a minor in history while simultaneously completing a BFA with a uh, concentration in sculpture from the University of North Texas. Currently, Potsky is completing 
an MFA with a concentration in sculpture from the University of Houston School of Art, and has exhibited her work in Houston, including um, solo exhibitions at the Elgin Street Studios and, and at Silver Street Studios. Um, outside of Houston, um, she's also exhibited her work um, in Denton, Texas, uh, at the Paul uh, Bowman Lightwell Gallery. Thank you, oh. welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, wow, uh, last but not least, right? Um, I don't know like, how I could possibly follow all of these amazing artists that came before me with such powerful work and I just bring an, such an amazing presence to this museum and I'm so honored that I get to kind of wrap it up. So I hope I can do it justice. Um, but uh, since this is the thesis show, thesis exhibition, I thought I would go ahead and actually give you guys a bit of my thesis. Uh, so I can kind of get these points out kind of fast and quick, okay? Um, so where it all begins, uh, the root of my practice uh, stems from my interest in history. Um, not necessarily just human history, but geological history as well. Um, I spent my entire childhood and youth um, practicing um, my drawing skills and learning how to do everything very photorealistically and just really observing the world around me. And as my family traveled a lot during this, I was very observant to the things that I was seeing and the things I was interested in and how to replicate them onto a piece of paper. Um, as that interest grew um, and spending so much time looking at all the beautiful scenery and objects that interest me, um, I learned to also appreciate how they either exist or how they were made. Um, a great deal of my life, um, excuse me, I looked forward to studying art um, and history in college, and so I did just that during my undergrad. I started off um, in the history program, and I learned as much as I could through that and prior, uh, just prior, um, personal research. Um, but through that, I began to understand that I was more or less interested in art history, and so I jumped ship from history and went straight into art, and that's what leads me here today. Um, I'm especially um, interested in art history as it relates to archaeology that includes artifacts or objects and the childhood compulsion to reproduce um, the iconography from the things I enjoy, such as the European Renaissance, Mediterranean and Levant cultures have uh, slowly worked its way and into completely encapsulating my current practice. Um, originally, my practice began as a heavily modernist or minimalist inspired sculptural concentration, um, and I think this is inspired by the formal education I received as a sculpture major at the University of North Texas. Um, they were very much interested in um, non-representational abstract forms, and so I was really interested in that. Um, but I kind of paired it up against itself with my interest in European history and um, artworks from antiquity, as well as the Renaissance, um, and kind of like tried as hard as I could during my undergrad to put them together. Um, what I learned during trying to, trying to do that is that labor is one of the most important parts of my practices, and I think that labor defines it. Um, so what I kind of became engaged with as I moved along this journey of labor and materials, I realized I was engaging in craft, um, traditional craft, modern craft, and what I've come to define as modified craft. Um, so what I mean by modified craft is using traditional crafts or industrial methods and trades um, and changing them and bending the expectations of the materials from what they what once were um, intended for into something completely different. <clears throat> uh, once I fully realized that um, this is where my practice was going to lead me, I began to think about the cliche conversation of art versus craft, um, which who can answer that? Um, which is a known contradiction within the art world. Um, but in, in my opinion, I'm arguing that they are one and the same. Um, the, a solution to this debate for me is my research and looking at artifacts of the past that are now only considered high art after hundreds or thousands of years have passed. Um, things such as statues, uh, mosaics, columns, um, pottery and architecture, um, all of these objects are now regarded as, like, as iconic cherished works of art, but were originally seen and conceived of as products of craft and trade. Uh, so that's what I'm especially um, interested in, especially with this um, exhibition series I have in front of you, um, which I have named um, aesthetic, 
uh, artifact aesthetics, excuse me. Um, artifact aesthetics kind of encapsul encapsulates the Mediterranean cultures and all of the recognizable artworks that you may be already be familiar with. Um, and I call these objects artifacts um, because I think that I'm recreating them through my own lens of inspiration, scopes, and material choices. Um, to kind of sum it up, a uh, few things that are really the foundational cornerstones of my practice include uh, labor, craft, and aesthetic, and um, also the notion of illusion. Um, all of these objects are made in a way or with materials that um, can send the viewer to a different assumption than what they may actually be. Uh, for example, um, this piece over here titled Ap uh, Soft Apollo, excuse me, um, is mimicking a Greek bust of the god Apollo. Um, and at first glance, he may seem or appear to be hard from across the room, but as you get closer, you realize that it is in indeed made of sheep's wool. Um, so it's very soft to the touch and to the, and to the gaze. Uh, so the notion of illusion is very apparent in this work as well as the others. Um, so I guess that kind of concludes the introduction to the body of work. Can you talk about some of your processes um, in pick any of these works really because the the process your approach is so different right and uh, your your use of material is so surprising right so um, <clears throat> excuse me uh, materiality is what really drives my practice um, before I kind of discover or research what item or what object or what um, aesthetic that I'm going to be replicating or uh, recreating, it all starts with the materials. I love to do material research and I usually take deep, deep dives on them. Uh, for example, um, weaving or felting um, was something I had done very amateurly um, beforehand, but during this process of the thesis, I really discovered just how old and how far back and which cultures are associated with all these processes go. And that therefore informs the objects I choose to make out of them, trying to push them to the opposite end of the spectrum of what they were intended for. So can you describe that a little more then? <laughs> With this one in yeah, particular? Well, sure, any, anything, but since you were starting there. <laughs> right. Um, so my interest in needle felting started with the, um, my awareness of the contemporary sculptor named Stephanie Metz, um, and she's a prolific uh, needle felter. And I was researching her work on how she gets these amazing large-scale forms out of this um, unassuming material, which is sheep's wool. And I began to, like I said, research the actual history of felt. And it is one of the oldest known methods for creating fabrics or textiles in human history. It predates many civilizations. It predates most cultures. Um, and so thinking about that, I took it upon myself to really ask myself, what can I do with this material that it will just be so bizarre, but will push myself and my dedication to the material and to the labor of it, what would be the weirdest thing I could do in relation to my body of work? And so I've always wanted to carve marble. I've always wanted to learn how to do, like engage in those traditional um, trades. And so I came upon carving a Greek bust. <laughs> with it. And so I was, the purpose of it was to make it as convincing as possible. Other questions? I'm curious if that spells one, that's amazing. I Thanks. <laughs> Right, there is a, um, good observation, uh, there is a, um, kind of small scale styrofoam core at the center of it, um, probably about this big, and then like a ball and a chopstick <laughs> going down. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So it's an, it's an additive method, meaning I'm putting material on top and on top and on top. And surprisingly, the more I did it and the more hours I spent doing this in just incredibly intense 
like stabbing motion, the more I equated it to what it probably feels like to a do actual marble carving. The chiseling, the hours, the repeated like hammering motion that is required to do it, I felt very in tune with the actual like original process it would have taken to make this out of marble. I think we get a lot of um, a lot of comments on the mosaic. The mosaic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll walk over here then. Uh, Joe had a question. Oh, okay, okay. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Um, as far as the needle felting in this sort of fashion goes, um, I think for the next like month I'm done. <laughs> um, but af after uh, my, my triceps get a good sleep, um, I actually really want to discover if it is possible to make a full size nude from in this in this fashion. So yeah, I, that would definitely be interested in kind of like pushing that. <laughs> Thanks. Me either. Cool, I can, okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, uh, did you have a specific question for me? Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, again, the concept of illusion was at the forefront of this piece. Um, I first actually started out with the idea of a mosaic um, and then sort of rolled into material discovery. Um, this is actually craft store foam um, that is mimicking ceramic tiles that would originally be used in Mediterranean cultures for these types of mosaics. Um, and how, how the act of illusion comes into that is from the front, it looks heavy, just like you said. It looks heavy, it looks real, it looks like it's ceramic. And then you walk up close to it and you start to see the ripples and the change in uh, surface texture. And something's not right, you know what I mean? I've had to really convince people that this is not tiles, it's um, craft store foam. I think there's 37,000 individual tiles here. So definitely a, a labor of love. Um, but it does, I, I'm gonna touch it, I guess, since I can, but it is extremely light. It is made on a shower curtain, so it weighs no more than a shower curtain does, so. Is it painted? It is painted, yeah, the individual tiles are painted, just with acrylic paint. What was your inspiration behind creating what really is Um, well, I wanted to do something that was referential, but not hyper-specific. Um, so I researched a lot, a lot of um, Mediterranean mosaics, and a, a lot of them, even if they had other imagery and other scenes, included a sun. And so I landed on the sun as being a kind of gestalt symbol for Mediterranean culture. Hmm? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the con concept of illusion um, specifically, I don't think I kind of s started there. It was something that gradually happened that I'm still discovering for myself. Um, but even during my undergrad, I was using a lot of steel and I was falsifying the age of the steel. So I would um, kind of... Um, artificially age it with all sorts of acids and solutions. And I started to ask myself why, and I realized that it was the idea of the illusion of age that interests me. And so I've kind of expanded on that here. So while things may not look like they are physically decayed, they are referencing things that are decayed. It has the illusion of age, whether by concept, context, or materials. So that's something I'm still uh, kind of discovering more for myself what illusion means to me. Uh, 
Um, for the photography, and I'm not a photographer. Wow, I know nothing about photography or printing or scaling or anything. Um, but I took, I took a shot at it. Um, these are photographs. <laughs> Thanks. Um, these are photographs of people that are very close to my personal life. Um, this is my, my boyfriend in acting, um, Michelangelo's David. And this is my best friend, Harley, um, kind of mimicking contraposto postures of um, Greek nudes. Um, but these are real life models that I take into my studio, cover in gold leaf. I have them stretch and move, and it creates these beautiful, totally unexpected, like, um, fissures that I thought were just so beautiful and I decided that that's what I wanted the piece to be about and so after the photographs were taken and selected I edited out their skin to kind of remove that vehicle for assumption about um, different contexts and politics so what you're looking at is truly just like the mirage of a person that is inspired by classical works. Okay, and then one last question. You know what it is. What? <laughs> what, what's oh. happening next for you? <laughs> um, what's happening next? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I would love to keep teaching at the collegiate level. It's something that I've gotten a lot of inspiration from, as well as drive from. I'm kind of like an activist in a different context. I really want to keep these uh, like traditions and like labors alive um, within the contemporary art world. So that's something I'm interested in kind of fighting for. But um, other than that, I, I really am looking into um, either residencies or private conservatories to learn more about traditional methods. Thank you, Katie. Well, thank you. <laughs>